I'm Christopher, and this is my delightful and beautiful wife. <laughs> I'm Angela. Angela. And uh, good to see you here if you're here today live. If you have any questions or comments or anything, you know, stick them down in the uh, bottom part. And we love answering your questions, if it's quail or chicken related or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So tonight, we'll be talking about winterization, you know, winterproofing stuff. I mean, a lot of it seems intuitive, but there's some tricks, wouldn't you say? Yeah, um... Yeah, I, I think some people who aren't quite familiar with poultry and birds um, will, like, they'll have, like, the pet mentality of, like, how, how would I treat my dog or my cat? Kind of right. Different. Or worse than that, they think of it in human terms. Yeah. You know, our intuition tells us to treat things like, um, like we would want to be treated. And, of course, their biology is much, much different. Oh, it's Mark. Hey, Mark. How you doing, buddy? Thanks for stopping in. Yeah, it's good to see you in here. So a little bit about us real quick. We always do this to let any new people know. We're Small Hatchery in Southern Lancaster County. What are the two things we kind of focus on? We focus on jumbo quail. Um, it's uh, the, the, the uh, Coternix. It's a mouthful. Coternix um, quail. Yeah, they, the jumbo ones, they are the best for meat and eggs. They have the, the meatiest size body. They're like the size of a grapefruit. Um, and then they lay a lot of eggs, like 300 or more eggs per year per hen. But the eggs are the largest size quail egg um, amongst the quail. So. Yeah, man. These things became really popular, I guess, after Corona Apocalypse. Everybody moved out of the cities. A lot of people did. And they got small homesteads. And yeah. they were looking for animals. Or they just wanted to have something in, what, what do you call those when it's not the city? It's in between. Suburb. Suburb. Mm -hmm. I live in the country. So... The people in the suburbs wanted to have uh, chickens, but they can't for whatever reason. Either there's not enough space, they have ordinance against it, or mm -hmm. they're loud, they don't want the noise of rooster, or... Or they're limited, they can maybe have two. And they're, mm -hmm. they're a little more expensive. And when I say a little more, I mean a lot more. Yeah, the... Um, the amount of eggs you get from the quail and quickly pile up with the, like, severely less space needed to keep them compared to chickens. Chickens require more space. They're a larger bird. Um, it's, we love chickens. Chickens yeah, are great. Yeah, we also have chickens. <laughs> Not anti-chicken. We are just, we love the quail, and we encourage everyone of any experience level, whether you're brand new to birds or animals or you're very experienced on a farm. Um, they're just very efficient with uh, being able to produce eggs to feed your family and then meat to fill your freezers, but also they're easy to, to take care of. They don't need a lot of space, like we already said. Um, and it's just overall very rewarding to have them. That is correct. Yeah. yeah, so I don't wanna get too much into that because you go, we do a ton, there's a ton of education that we have on here on the YouTube yeah. and on Facebook. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look in the description down here in the video, there's a bunch of links that I put together. It's PDF stuff, how to, you know, Q and A's, just really easy to read, easy to get started and understand, mm -hmm. right? And the other thing we raise or she raises are your silky chickens. Yeah, silkies. They're, and the, the main thing about the silkies is they're um, the Bantam type, um, and that means they're a miniature chicken. So if you have like a standard layer breed of chicken, um, a silky would be, of the Bantam variety, would be at least half the size in body or less, even smaller, than a, a layer breed. Um, they're pretty much mostly fluff, <laughs> yeah, but they're known as being the best chicken breed to be as to have as a pet because they're very docile, friendly. You can easily just if they're bred properly and according to the the standard of perfection for the breed, um, then you can easily just pick them up. Kids can pick them up and be gentle and hold them, and they'll just sit there. Yeah, and the silkies. Yeah, they're they're pet birds. They're really yeah. nice. They do lay eggs very, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they do lay eggs. So. Um, I guess that's it. Do we have any quail eggs? Can I show a quail yeah. egg? People always ask, like, what does a quail egg look like? And, uh, it's only two. There's so many quail eggs. So they're smaller than chicken eggs because they come from birds that are smaller than chickens. So my hand, I have, I have small man hands. So, <laughs> they're masculine. But, um, I'll just hold one up. So they're kind of cute. They're speckled. Oh, little FYI. This is the fingerprint, right? Mm -hmm. When the hen lays an egg, it comes out speckle, but the speckle pattern is going to be the same every time, or very similar. Very similar, yeah. So kind of cool. To that hen. So if you are familiar with your hens or when which one lays during the day, 
you'll know who's laying. <laughs> yeah. um, so like three of these eggs are equivalent to about one chicken egg, right? And again, I don't want to get into the whole quail thing. We'll get a ton of videos about that and we'll do it yeah. again. But if you're, you want to raise them, you know, there's some very simple basic grade school math you can do to figure out how many you need for your family. Now, mm -hmm. on to the show. Yeah. We're doing winterizing, Winter right? Yeah. yeah, we do. So the cute little thumbnail, I like drawing. I like doing kids' illustrations. So I do all of our artwork. Here's our quail book, right, for the kids. We have kids involved with the quail because they're, they're actually really good um, creatures for the little ones to get involved with because they're so easy to take care of. Mm -hmm. They're in a hutch. Okay, so moving on. Winterizing. So we are in southern Lancaster County. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. Which means it gets <laughs> pretty cold. Yeah, it gets, it can get, so cold for us, cold night temperatures would be yeah. in the, the low 20s. Um, mm -hmm. Usually winter time is around, you know, low 30s. Um, yeah, that's... We do get sub freezing temperatures though. Yeah, we do have on occasion. Yeah, like last winter we'll have a week straight of below zero. And then there's the freezing. wind chill. It'll be windy and that yeah. makes it really cold. So that's stuff to keep in mind. We have to prepare for for the birds. I think the main issue that I'm gonna discuss, because it's the laborious one, is the water. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the main thing labor wise that people are struggling with if they're not attending to uh, satisfying the freezing issue with the water. Right? Yeah, um, and I know we're gonna we're gonna talk about we're gonna options. discuss it. We're gonna talk about the options, different things to do. So um, we did an indoor versus outdoor raising quail video. This is where raising them indoors would be a benefit because you're not <laughs> yeah, gonna control you can temperature, con control temperature, control mm -hmm. zones. Mm -hmm. But most people are raising them outside. So there's a couple things you can do to keep the water from freezing during those really cold days. So what do, do we do? So, what do we use? Well, just to, to mention a couple different ideas, um, because it depends on your setup and how many birds you have. If you just have yeah. one hutch and it's not a ton of birds, then I oh, get cool. blue Oh, blue cool. Eggs. Oh, that's awesome. Um, then you may not need to do, you know, much change with the water system. So uh, an idea would be, there's the um, twist um, waters where it's like a... a how would you like a cup area it's a gravity um, fed reservoir yeah and it's just a the the twist off ones you can have um, multiples of those and so she's talking about it will freeze yeah the, the whole little freeze but then you'll take it out and then replace it with a new one so, so you'll have more than one <clears throat> when that works fine and we've done that yeah and we do that with our smaller hutches because we have multiple different hutches and um grow out hutches and we do that with the ones where there's not as many quail in there um, but yeah, like in the morning, I'll go out and switch with a fresh warm water to just have it l last a little long before it freezes. Um, and then if it's super cold, then maybe uh, later in the day, I'll switch it again. I'll bring the, the, other, the frozen one in for it to thaw and yeah. Yeah, but bum, bum, bum. Then you have cages with lots of quails and you don't want to be taking out big things of water. So yeah. what do you do? What do we use? We use so, submersibles, right? Yeah, at, at right now what we do is... Um, we use like aquarium heaters, um, or you can use. I took notes like, from the internet. So there's different types of heaters. This is a submersible. <laughs> yeah, the submersible. Those ones. Yeah, I'll get pictures of us again. Yeah. The submersible one that's for poultry or for like bird baths are yeah. nice because they're weighted, and then they'll just you know they'll stay they'll go on down the into the bucket. <clears throat> so what we do is um, that works for us at present is we will have. Um, the electronic heater in the water and then it's in like a, a larger container with holes cut out in the sides of the container and they just stick their heads and in this the is drink. for a quail yes not the for quail. chicken but we also use them for the chickens um but with the quail this setup um it works great it keeps the water you know oh not I know. we I, um we have it plugged into like a light timer um and it'll kick on like the colder, like when they're going to be drinking and, and stuff, like right before um, they're waking up in the morning and just maybe periodically throughout the day, just to make sure it stays, you know, not frozen. Um, or they also have, uh, I don't know what <laughs> like plug things are called, but there's these things that you can plug in and plug into 
um, where a split, oh, yeah, it it's senses a three prong. the oh, temperature. Yeah. A and temperature it'll, shut it'll, off. Right. It'll turn on the heater when it senses the temperature dropping like to a certain temperature, like 40 I, yeah, degrees or something. It, I'll explain that because that's important. You can put a submersible heater or another, whatever your defrosting or de-icing device, you can plug it into rather than plugging it directly into the wall or directly into a socket. Or a, a, ti a light timer you could use. You, you could use a timer or you could have it into a specific um, plug that kicks on once it reaches X amount of temperature, yeah. whatever then you that set way, the temperature it, for. It's not running excessively long if you if, if electric <laughs> use is something that you're thinking about. Um, although it shouldn't use very much. Now the thing about using uh, what I just described with like a, a big container of water and then the holes it, with having them stick their heads in and drinking works great, although because they're wetting their beaks um, and then they go and eat, and then the food sticks to their beaks, the type of food that we It'll, use, yeah. then it goes into the water. So then we do have to make sure to clean it more often, yeah, the container. Yeah, they're pigs. So that, that's the issue. The, any, the, an issue, I'm sorry, with any of these electronic solutions is, I think the main one would be power cutoffs. Yeah. Or shorting, like if something turns off. So you still want to monitor them daily. You never know what's happening in the lines, too, in your electrical lines. If you're using uh, cords, there could be a short. You get a little mouse chew on a cord. Mm -hmm. And if you're <clears> leaving <throat> them out there for days at a stretch, and one night is freezing, and you didn't check, you'll come out to a bunch of bird sickles. I would definitely, if you're going to use heaters, uh, electric heaters, I would definitely, mm -hmm. um, in, in, under the water, always have uh, one or two spare. Because, yeah. you know, they just, sometimes they just Break out. die. Right. <laughs> yeah. Another, a quail, so I'm going to show you another quail um, water solution for the winter. Let's just pull these off of Amazon. So that's a heated bucket. So they're not putting their heads in there. It has nipples. You could buy one. You could build one if you're doing it for quail. I mean, you could even, use, like, this is for chicken. I've got a little mm -hmm. chicken picture on there. But you can use it for quails. Uh any kind of thing you're putting into their cage is going to take up floor space, too. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. right. And you can maybe figure out a way to rig it so that it's on the outside of the cage. And then if you're using, like, the nipple type, then have that go into the cage without creating holes for predators to get in. But Which that, that like option do. would give uh, your keep your water clean. All right. So predator, we did water. I'm going to go on to the habitat or the hutch system. Again, we're going to talk about chicken and quail. We're mainly quail focused. Do you want to talk about them separate or do you want to talk about the water for the chickens too? I mean, because it's not. So, I mean, it's, just, it's essentially the same thing. It's the thing. same thing, except chickens are in a bigger area. Um, Let me show so these guys one more thing if they're spacing. looking. Another option for heating, especially for chickens, is a pad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the main three things. It's submersible, heated, mm -hmm. and... Um, heated nipple heated buckets and um heated pads to keep yeah. the water from freezing so they can get mm -hmm. to their stuff so if you guys haven't set that up and if you're looking there but, are um, options with the the chickens it's not they're them dirtying the water isn't really the same necessarily like the quail, quail. um it's they're easier because the chickens are in a bigger area sorry it's easier to take care of the water and you know just watch it if you have a hutch system for quail you want to make sure it's efficient well, the quail, to the quail versus chicken, so the quails are going to be eating and going to water, eating and going to water, eating and going to water, whereas chickens just, blah, 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 they eat everything, mm -hmm. and they're not going to be transporting so much debris into that water. I mean, can yeah. you imagine if chickens did the same behavior? It would be filthy, filthy every day. Yeah. They kind tend like, to visit the water right first thing in the morning when they come out of their, their coop, and then, you know, throughout the day here and there. So most of you guys are probably more familiar with chickens, so the quail do make... Uh, a reservoir dirtier if they're getting their face into it. So this is where you might want a, um, a bucket system or something with nipples on it that's heated to where they can get to that because you're not going to be dealing with that. If you do use um, the, the nipple type things where they touch the drip of water on it, just check the, re the reviews for them. There are um, types that don't freeze um, and then there are types that they can break easy if they do freeze. Yeah. So just look into that if you want to do that. Yeah, speaking of which, <laughs> we had a freezing night. We're using a gravity system, and it did 
you know, the water expanded and broke off some of the connections. Mm -hmm. So that's the other reason you want to make sure everything's turned on and functioning. You don't want to have ruptures. So with that mentioned too, it's good to have a backup system. Like we mentioned, the first thing that we mentioned was the twist type, um, mm -hmm. little simple reservoir um, feeder, right. the gravity fed um, canisters. So then if something happens to your system, you can just quick give them water and then solve the issue. Okay, I want to do the controversial one, like putting heaters into the hutches. So a lot of people put heaters in the hutches so their chickens are comfy. Mm -hmm. Not necessary, you know. Um, I think this is the intuition thing again. Like we want, we would want to have a heated room in the cold, so it makes sense to us as humans. But uh, the chicken and the birds, they're very, very well adapted for cold temperatures with their plumage, especially if you have a group of the birds, they do emperor penguin stuff. They all huddle together and they stay warm. I always like to say this, I told her, and I said this before in a video, if the cold was that much of a threat to these birds and they weren't designed for it, the birds would be all extinct. They would have froze over time. There'd be no more birds left. So they're, yeah. they're quite adapted to the cold They create little air pockets in their feathers, you know, they fluff their feathers up, just like a, a wetsuit for a human, I guess, or your own clothing, it creates a layer of warmth. Against uh, their uh, skin, between the feathers and their skin. And then the cold air, so they stay quite warm and they have, uh, of course, a higher metabolism. Yeah, they're, anyway. they're, I mean, like we don't have, you know, feathers or fur or anything, so we have to use stuff to keep ourselves warm. Yeah. Um, but animals, they're equipped. Um, in, in chickens and poultry, they're they're very adaptable uh, per whatever area you're Intuitively, in. it seems like it makes sense. Oh, I want these animals to be more comfortable. I'm going to add heat. But it could actually be more harmful than good because of the temperature change, right? Well, uh, before I, I go there, um, if you had one of those um, heat guns, what is it called? That if you point it on something and it senses the the heat, it sees red. Yeah, What's thermal it? thermal reader. Yeah, so if you point that to, on a bird, then you're gonna see the only areas it's losing heat will be the face and the feet. Uh, the rest of the body will look insulated um, and not losing heat. Um, so yeah, like Christopher said, both quail and chickens, they if it's super cold, um, then at night then they'll scooch together. Chickens like to roost on um, the roosting bars um, and the quail, they just kind of huddle together. <laughs> um, now, Christopher had just mentioned that um, heat can potentially cause issues with health. What, what oh, I thought I saw something on this. Oh. Um, so the thing about it is birds in general, uh, they're susceptible to respiratory issues. And- This is important. Ding, 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 ding. Mm -hmm. This is the important part. Yeah. So there, if, it, creatures um, that live in an environment, they're um, adjusted to that environment. But when you take a, a living creature from that environment and abruptly put it in a new environment, the temperature is different, everything's different, there's stress and... Such as a warm chicken house to freezing cold. To freezing cold, air. walking out of the coop, that can cause stress on the immune yeah, system. Stressing. They're susceptible to illness at this point. Um, so... The feather plumage keeps them warm in the coop. If it's super cold, they'll huddle together. Um, if it's if you only have like two chickens, um, well, I would recommend doing this anyway for super cold. You know, winters you're anticipating super cold. I would insulate the the coop, put some plastic either on the inside walls or on the outside. It's put like a windbreaker, yeah, like for a jacket, extra drafts and stuff, and then. Put extra bedding in there, padding along the sides, and fluff it up um, just to help with insulating the house itself, especially if there's only like a few birds in there. Um, chickens is kind of what I'm referring to in that sense. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, if you guys are using heaters and you're like, oh, these zombies don't know what they're talking about, my chicken. Some people do use the heaters, but it's not necessary. If you feel like you're you're not if you if you're someone who is pro heater which again the chickens don't we're talking about chickens right now they don't they don't need heater um but if you want to use some sort of heating element then i would recommend having it on a timer so that uh, several hours before the bird the chickens come out of the coop the coop is cooling 
so that it's going to be easy for them to go out into the cold and it's similar, the temperature. Um, people, they tend to end up experiencing ill chickens in the wintertime because if something happens, they get sick for some reason. Here's chickens that need heaters. Then <laughs> this is the type of chicken you'll probably want a heater for. <laughs> Um, people who end up with chickens Naked, that are ill, chickens. they'll bring them inside to treat them and isolate them and, um, you know, give them medicine. And then they'll take them back outside in the wintertime. And then the chicken just like will get sick again. And it's, it's like a long process because of that cold and hot, cold and warm. Um, it's just really rough on them. Again, yeah, I like, I like the biology aspect of everything. So uh, intuitively our intuition, right? Intuition is pretty fabulous and sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. And when we uh, like transpose our human attributes onto different biology, that's where we get screwed up because you know we want to think of the chicken or the bird very similarly to humans, but they're very, very different. And just to finish up the point about chickens, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the quail in that, um, it's very important all year round to make sure your coop is properly <clears throat> ventilated, which this is actually the same with the quail not well the quail they they're better they they need a lot of ventilation compared to the chickens but the chickens you don't want it to be drafty um it needs to be proper ventilation and when we're looking at the winter time and cold temperatures they're breathing and christopher had talked about this on the last video um they're expelling moisture through the breathing and and you see that when you breathe in the winter time you can see your breath and that's that's you know moisture coming out. So if your coop is drafty and it's not properly ventilated, then, um, and there's, you know, manure in there as well. The manure is gonna create um, more dampness um, and it could be, uh, the acidity levels could be higher. If you don't have an issue with the manure, that's good. You wanna keep a clean coop. Uh, but the, you don't want moisture and dampness in the air with draftiness because that's going to make them susceptible to illness as well, respiratory illness as well. Yeah, in a sealed... It's going to make them actually feel cold. In the wintertime, in a sealed hutch, in a sealed room with quail, it'll become like a, a sauna if you have a bunch of them in there. It'll become very, very moist. Yeah. So you want to keep the ventilation even on the cold nights. You want to have a windbreak. Uh, our hutches are sealed one half of the... No, you're talking about the quail. Yeah, our hutches for the quail on a portion of it, they're all ventilated, but on a portion of it toward the, you know, one side, the front, the side, and the back are sealed. They have a, you know, a piece of wood. It's a wind guard. So they can go in there, and there's a floor. It's a sealed floor as well. So one, it's like two, a sandbox three, shelter. four sides sealed, ceiling, totally ventilated like the entire cage. But they can go in there to get away from the wind mm -hmm. and take a little bit of shelter, and they like to lay their eggs in there. Anyway. That keeps them pretty much mm -hmm. secure from the wind and the cold, and yeah. they do well in there, and it doesn't need to be overly, um, what do you call, sealed up. Mm -hmm. They're pretty fine yeah, from the cold. It's, their bodies do the job. And like they, Christopher just mentioned, you want to shield them from the wind, the harsh winds, um, and any, like, you know, falling elements, like rain and snow yeah. and such. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, strolling along, anything else you want to talk about with heating? I think not. Mm -hmm. So, in short, we don't recommend heating. It's not necessary. The animals mm -hmm. are exceptionally well-designed to heat themselves. And then if you lose power and that heating element suddenly gets kicked off and they're used to having it on That's quite true. overnight, then it's going to be a shock to their system in their coop. You know, yeah. Overnight. Oh, another thing too. I'm glad you mentioned that. They, uh, there's going to be, um, there could be a compromise of the regulation of body temperature. The animal is going to adjust to having um, artificial heating, and they may have a little difficulty with temperature regulation, especially with the changing. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Anyway, moving on. Oh, again, you guys have questions or anything? Stick them down in the old comment section. They pop up, even if it's after this live. I always get to them. We'll answer them or. Send us a message over on the Facebook. We get tons of messages over there. All right. Next, I would like to discuss nutritional needs. Not the macronutrients, but just a general discussion about nutritional mm -hmm. needs. What are they doing in the winter? So in the winter, um, are we assuming 
that there's extra lighting, artificial lighting added to keep productivity we'll up with We'll just say eggs. that, sure, we got artificial um, lights in there. So they are now using energy to stay warm. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there will be people, you'll probably hear of people throughout the winter where they'll say, oh, my, my, my girls, what, chickens and um, the quail, not really... The quail are... We'll finish are, the sentence. Okay, sorry. I'm talking about the chickens. <laughs> um, this, the, they do have their differences, the quail and the, and the chickens do. Um, but anyway, people will have their hens laying eggs and they have lighting and they're like cranking out eggs during the wintertime and suddenly it just starts petering out and they stop. And they're like, I don't understand what's going on. I didn't change their food. I didn't change their, their lighting. They're, they're, they're well cared for. Um, likely a very possible... Um, thing is that now they're using a lot more energy to stay warm and making an egg takes a lot of energy too. So if, if they aren't getting more energy from food, if the food amount is the same, something's going to give. So they're going to stop laying. Um, so you just increase their food, um, during the cold months of winter, you, you know, like the more protein or just more quantity of a feed. And your chickens that were free ranging are not finding any of that delicious mm -hmm. stuff. They were finding all spring and summer and early fall. All, the, all yeah. the bugs are going to sleep and the greenery stopped growing. So you may not be thinking about that because you're not feeding it to them, but they are getting a substantial amount of nutrients just from scrounging around. And a lot of people like to give extra corn, like scratch, um, because corn, it's, it is, uh, an energy source ingredient. Um, and it also, when you increase corn into their feed, um, then it'll help them kind of, uh, develop like a fat, more fat layer in their body, which that'll insulate them more during the winter as well. Yeah. And, um, I guess we, we feed ours. We have fermented whole feed. mixed grains. Um, Speaking of which, I always love this. We're going to talk about our fabulous... Grain that we put together, my little dinosaur, it's a bag of pillows actually, but it's a prop. But yeah, we give them a whole grain diet and we ferment mm -hmm. our feed for yeah. our chickens. So there's so healthy have, probiotics in there. Yeah, we put, it's, so we blended this, we, we blended this with NutriBalancer, mm -hmm. Breeder Supplement, which there, there is some extra amino acids, probiotics, prebiotics are in there mm -hmm. to help the critters um, digestive tract. So that's pretty important to us. And if you learn about the gut microbiome, which is an exceptionally complex and uh, elegant piece of biology to maintain our health, it's the same for the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. You know, they have an active uh, flora gut biology that keeps them healthy and feeding them proper food, a um, variety yeah. of diet and uh, access it, it to these. It boosts their immune system. Yeah, and too. access to fermented foods. Yeah, like yeah we say, rarely have system. any health issues year round because they're getting... Um, the healthy mix concoction of, of whole non-GMO um, foods that we mix, grains that we mix, and ingredients, and then on top of that, fermenting it. It's really, really good for them. <laughs> yeah, if you guys have any questions about feed, um, check out our Facebook page, give me a call or text. What do we have is the other thing, our, um, what's the other page? My Little Dinosaur, mm -hmm. name of the food. There's a Facebook page. There's a lot of, like, again, we stress education because my theory is don't treat people like idiots. If they don't know, give them the information so they can make an educated decision based on knowledge and fact. You know, I don't believe in persuading people with emotion. I'm one of those, I'm, I guess, engineer brain. Give me the give me the data. I'll make a decision based on the data. And the data says feed them, you know, we feed them the whole grain diet and we ferment it. I mean, really, they should be eating a wild chicken diet, right? Mm -hmm. Worms, crickets, grasses, but... Most people can't just feed them that all the time. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to do that. So you want to supplement a natural uh, grazing diet that the wild version of this animal eats. You want to supplement it with uh, quality food as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So then um, also... And in with the winter, the, give them more because they're hungry. Yeah. And so the quail, the reason why the quail is a little different is that um, they should always have food available to them like 24 seven, um, not because they're pigs, but because they have a faster metabolism than chickens do. Um, so they're, they're just like burning faster. And yeah, they, they won't overeat. Yeah, they eat what they need. Chickens will overeat. Chickens will get fat and they'll put fatty tissue yeah, on Yeah, they're them. like goldfish. They'll just like, they'll be so full of their crop and then they just 
they act like they're starving. <laughs> so if you're doing chickens for meat and you just feed them and feed them and feed them and they get super big, and then when you process them, you're going to notice all of that uh, that layer of yellow fat mm -hmm. under their skin. They, you know, they'll, they'll just keep eating. The quail are not going to be like this. Um, one one last thing on chickens. Um, so we feed our serving sizes uh, per day for our chickens uh, so they don't overeat, so that they're eating the proper amount. Some people, uh, whatever food they're feeding, they're able to give them like kind of free reign and eat. Uh, it's not measured out and the chickens don't really overeat it. It just depends on the type of food that you're feeding them. They love this stuff. So we want to make sure they're eating what they need, not overeating. Yeah, and you but, don't want to waste Yeah, because it adds and, up over time. And uh, anyway, so if you're feeding them um, more of a serving size, then you can feed them uh, a little later in the day so that um, they have their crop is full uh, closer to when they're going to sleep because then their body is going to be working on digesting that food in their pouch, going into their whole system. Oh, wait, system. pause. We did a really cool digestion video, I guess we did on YouTube, mm -hmm. a couple of videos back live. It's really interesting if you go back, learn about the um, digestive tract of the chicken mm -hmm. from mouth to out. <laughs> right, please. Continue. So that process will um, create, uh, that will increase their warmth for their body. Um, so you can do that as well. Um, now the quail, they will be eating more during the winter time for the same reason the chickens need more food. They are using their energy to stay warm. So you will notice that you're gonna have to make sure your feeders are you know, adequately topped off um, or filled. Um, and it's the same thing, like during the summertime, they don't eat as much food, but they drink a lot more water because it's now hot. In the wintertime, they, they don't drink as much water, but they're eating more food because they need the energy to stay warm. So that's really... Makes sense. Simple yeah. enough. All right. Cool. Um, I think that's about it with food. It, so the short version of all that, they're going to eat more in the winter because it's cold. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, I think we're almost done. The last thing I want to go over is like... Um, emergency issues, which we kind of discussed before. I think some of the major issues is the electric going out. Um, the electric going out, check on the, check on your lines. Like whatever yeah, you always heated. test your heaters be well before you're going to be installing them <laughs> um, to make sure they're all working properly, your cords, like whatever you're using So how working. would I test my heater? Um, this is not for me. This is for somebody who might be thinking this. How do I test my heater? Plug it in? Stick it in the well, water? Well, yeah, I mean, you want to make sure it's cold water um, so that it actually kicks <laughs> on. Um, it just depends on what type of heater you're using yeah. and how it operates. Even the expensive stuff, and you the still want to test it. We say test it is because you don't want to end up like last minute <laughs> getting, oh no, it's getting, the temperatures are dropping and the water's freezing, <laughs> let me put the heaters in, and some of them don't work. And now you have to, you know, replace them and that might, that could create stress for you and you don't want that. Yeah, that would not be good. Yeah. So. Did you want to talk about predators? Predators, I love talking about <laughs> predators. Predators, because we have them coming around. Winter time, yeah, we're gonna finish up on a grand story of predators. It's winter time, and what happens in the spring? Everybody starts having their babies. babies. <laughs> so they better stay alive in the winter. And, and uh, plump up if they can. Yeah, it's kind of hard to do that because everything's going to sleep. So the predators are... Migrating. Yeah, my, or they're migrating. So the predators start changing their patterns, and they smell chickens, and they smell quails. Mm -hmm. They may start coming around to your animal hutches, and rats as well. With food droppings, they're going to see that, and that's going to be an opportunity. You know, it's scarcity. Mm -hmm. We live in a even, house. Even um, birds of prey. Yeah. yeah. So humans, again, if you're starving, you can call the delivery guy. But when the rats and skunks and minks and everybody else is Fox. starving, yeah. they got to get outside and go look for food, and it may be over at the quail hutches yeah. and the chicken hutches. So predatory behavior does change in the winter. It changes throughout the seasons. Mm -hmm. So spring, summer, winter you're gonna have new issues coming up. Okay? Yeah. Because their, um, their behavior and their ranges change. So with the quail, you wanna make sure um, any any uh, wire or, uh, that there's no holes that are the size of an inch 
um, or bigger because the smaller predators, minks and rats, they can fit right through that. Um, and raccoons, they can stick their mm. little hands in and grab your birds and cause, you know, injury or death to your quail. Chickens, um, I've seen lots of people, you know, share stories about, oh, you know, we would free range them and then we, we, we you know, we didn't even, we didn't close the, the coop door or, or maybe they, they, the, the whole coop itself wasn't super, um, predator proof, but they never had any issues. And like, maybe they had them for five years and then suddenly, bam, a fox comes in and kills the entire flock. Um, that's devastating, especially yeah. for chickens because they take a lot longer to grow. It's a huge more, it's a bigger commitment to raise chickens. And then because they live longer, you get really attached to them. <laughs> so please, please predator proof your chicken coops and runs. Um, the, the coop, is the most important where they're sleeping because the chickens aren't going to move. They can't really, they can't see. They're just sitting, sitting there to be. Yeah. Do an inspection. Yeah. If you haven't just do an inspection of the coop, little holes that or gaps, mm -hmm. you know, as the things age, the wood moves around, it shrinks, mm -hmm. shifting happens. So you may want to check the gaps to see if anybody can squeeze in. Mm -hmm. And also you may have had something who maybe chewed a hole in earlier in the summer and they left access on the underside of the of your chicken house. Mm -hmm. So you want to take a look and you yeah, know just reinforce it. Yeah, you know, do a once over a couple times a year to make sure there's no breaches in their security so little critters aren't getting gobbled up at night. Or like a mink will get in there and yeah, eat they, full grown sized chickens. They're brutal minks, they go on like a blood rage. They just like start anyway. Um, yeah, they, and they'll, they'll take down large, I mean, even ducks. Mm, um, they look like a fuzzy sock. Yeah, they're not very big. <laughs> That's what they look like. <laughs> and they run like, like a fuzzy sock. <laughs> little black um, dots. And you don't, it's rare to even see them, but they're around. Um, and check to see if there are any, like, flimsy spots in the, in the walls, um, uh, in, with the integrity. Um, because if you get, like, a fox or even a dog or... Um, some people have larger animals, you know, like bobcats or cougars in their areas, um, that could get pushed, pushed, you know, and broken or pulled in, in a hole. So just, yeah, you def you definitely want to periodically throughout the year be checking your coops and... Yeah. And hopefully if you live in the cougar slash bobcat mm -hmm. area, that's in mountains, you're probably mm -hmm. used to that and you know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think that's about that. Yeah, so yeah. keep an eye on predators. I think we're just about... Square. I really didn't want to go too too deep into this because a lot of this seems again intuitive, but maybe not so much like the heating issue or you know how you're going to keep the water defrosted as it gets colder at mm -hmm. night. And cold nights are coming up. But I think that'll about wrap it up. Yeah. If you have any questions or want clarification on anything, just leave a comment and we will get back to you. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, thanks a million for stopping in. Leave a message if you have a question, and uh, I guess that's it. All right. Yeah, thank we'll you, guys. You. Bye.